Time now for Morning Rounds, our look at the medical news of the week, beginning with the latest news about the mosquito-borne Zika virus. As the weather gets warmer, mosquitoes become more active, and this week the CDC released a report analyzing statistics and Zika pregnancy within the United States. In part, the report found that last year about 1 in 10 pregnant women with Zika had a fetus or baby with birth defects, and that 44 states reported cases of pregnant women with evidence of Zika. The CDC noted that most of these cases were travel associated. CBS News Chief Medical Correspondent Dr. John LaPook and CBS News contributor Dr. Tara Narula are here to discuss. All right, Dr. LaPook, of the 1,300 women in this study, how many of them displayed symptoms during pregnancy? Well, they looked at the 972 who actually had the completed pregnancy. And of those, only 36 percent, so a little over a third, had symptoms. So you, we, we know that you don't have to have symptoms. And one of the interesting questions here was we were wondering, if you get infected with Zika during pregnancy, are you more likely to have a baby with a defect if you have symptoms than if you don't have mm -hmm. symptoms? And it turns out that birth defects were about equally of equal proportion whether you had symptoms or not. Did it matter, Tara, at what point in the pregnancy the women got infected? There's so much that we still have to learn about Zika, and in particular, at what point during the pregnancy might a woman be at highest risk if she gets infected? And in this uh, report, they did in fact find that in the first trimester, women seemed to be at the highest risk. So women who were pregnant and had lab confirmed Zika in the first trimester had a 15% chance of having a child, uh, infant, or baby with a birth defect. And that kind of goes along with another study out of Columbia that also showed that women who got infected in the first trimester or in this early second trimester seemed to be at the highest risk. Again, the CDC is telling everyone, all pregnant women, that you have to pay attention as well throughout the pregnancy, not just the first trimester, that there is risk throughout the entire pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Take precautions in terms of travel, mosquito protection, and sexual protection as well. So precautions should be broad here, right? 44 states. Yeah. That's, a, that's most of the states in the United States. And, and, what does that practically well, mean? And practically, I mean, people get confused about this. So there's travel associated infection. That means you picked it up somewhere else. You say South America, someplace. You brought it back to wherever you were, whatever that state was in the United States. It doesn't mean that there's local mosquitoes in that state who are infected. But remember, a little primer again, this is the first mosquito-borne illness ever to cause a birth defect. And it's the first mosquito-borne illness that we know that's also sex sexually transmitted. Right. So you have the double whammy there. So it's not just travel. The person can come up and have sexual relations with a person, a pregnant person, somewhere else where there, or the, where there aren't local mosquitoes that have Zika, and then you could get infection that way. And so the bottom line here is people who are pregnant, women who are pregnant have to really have a high level of, of being aware. Is there any possibility of being infected? And if that's true, you really have to be very closely followed. I read every single Zika headline. <laughs> I also, I just want you know, because people ask me this all the time. Google CDC or search for right. CDC space Zika space name of the place you want to travel to see if there's any local infection yeah. or CDC space Zika space whatever it is you're looking for. The CDC is constantly updating this. It's really important because it's changes. All right. Our next topic, dietary supplements and heart health. A new study published in the American Medical Association's Cardiology Journal looked at over 5,000 New Zealanders with an average age of 65. Some participants were given a monthly high dose of vitamin D. The others got a placebo. They were followed for an average of just over three years. Researchers wanted to see if the vitamin D supplement helped prevent cardiovascular disease. Tara, what did they find? So there's been a lot of questions around the relationship relationship between vitamin D and cardiovascular health since the 1980s when they started to make observations that people with low vitamin D seem to be at increased risk of cardiovascular disease. But the question really has been, does supplementation actually help? And in this study, when they looked at the groups who got the vitamin D and those who didn't, both groups had about the same risk, 12% of developing cardiovascular disease down the line. The vitamin D group was able to increase their vitamin D levels, but again, it seemed like in this study with monthly high dose supplementation, there really was no benefit. And the author are quick to point out, though, we don't know what would happen with different doses, with different frequencies, so daily or weekly supplementation or longer follow-up. So still a lot of unanswered questions. Right. How popular is vitamin D and vitamin D supplements in the U.S.? Well, the supplements in general are about half of the population takes it wow. in one wow. study. So, you know, a lot of people take it. There's a lot of data about this. It's really hard to show that the supplements really do help. They're still going 
Uh, they're doing research. Steve Nissen from the Cleveland Clinic uh, emailed me and told me that he's doing a big study, 13,000 people looking at omega-3 fatty acids to see if it has a role in people with high triglycerides and low HDL, low good cholesterol. But uh, right now, he, he, said, I'm not, he said, I'm not surprised by this study that I never did drink the Kool-Aid when it came to vitamin D. And <laughs> the Kool-Aid being vitamin D supplements. Well, that's what he said. Tara, as a cardiologist, do a lot of your patients ask about supplements for, they, for heart health? They do, and they ask about fish oil and things yeah. like that. But I think what's more important is that what people don't tell. Yeah. Um, and whether they don't tell because they're afraid that their doctor will say don't take it or they don't think it's important. Yeah. But it is important because a lot of these supplements, there really is no proven benefit to them. Mm -hmm. For most healthy Americans, things like multivitamins and antioxidants. And for other things like herbals, you know, these are really a class uh, that is unregulated. They don't have to prove safety, efficacy, or quality before they get out on the market. They can be mislabeled, they can be contaminated, they can have stimulants in them, and they can interact with a patient's regular prescription drugs. So just because it's natural doesn't mean it's safe. Talk to your doctor about what you're on. Okay, with that, <laughs> Drs. John LaPook and Taryn Arula, great to see you. Thanks for your time.